Uh, I saw you posted this morning. Yes. You're tra- I mean, training with Vic Mensa. Training with Vic Mensa. Chicago artist. Yeah. Good dude. I've he seen is. him perform. Um, I was went to the Sky Fever game like a yeah. month ago, and he showed up and like performed. Oh, like, really? Yeah, he, he did. Yeah, he did a couple songs before the, the game started. Yeah, I thought that was cool. Yeah, a lot of my teammates are like freaking out. They're like, mm-hmm. dude, what? Actually, I met him at a mosque. Really? Yeah, on uh, 21st and Halstead. Is he Muslim? He's Muslim. Oh, I didn't know that. And, uh, you know, by the end of the prayer, I'm like, is that Vic? Oh, it's got to be. Let me just say hello. Mm Because he was friends with a lot of my close friends. Mm -hmm. Like Myron, who's a big Chicago artist here Mm -hmm. and a musician. Um, Nico Siegel, who's Mm -hmm. Chance the Rapper's, like, uh, main um, trumpet. I don't want to say trumpet. Is it clarinet? (laughs) (laughs) I feel like... I don't know, but I feel like uh, trumpet would be more correct for Chance's music. No, but I, I really feel like it's the clarinet. Damn it. We can Google things here. Yes, okay. can we, it's, can yeah, we look course. it up? Yeah, of course. You got to look it up, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cause I, <laughs> it's allowed. Please, 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 Nico, don't watch this. Yeah. <laughs> he just invited me. Nico I would Sino. say we clip it out, but maybe we won't. Yeah, he did yeah. a big <laughs> song called Sunday Candy with, uh, That's right. with That's right. Uh, Chance. So he's pretty well known. Yeah. Trump. I knew it. It was the trumpet. It was trumpet. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. the trumpet. Gotcha. Okay, okay. So I was close. Yeah. So he. So Vic Mensa is a jujitsu guy. He's a boxer. He's a boxer. He's a boxer. So okay. when I first met him, uh, we were chatting a little bit mainly on Palestine mm-hmm. because he had gone down to Palestine. Really? Yes. Recently? Years ago. Okay. Like I, I remember that. reading his article in two, like I was still in anesthesia training. Mm. And he took out a piece on Time Magazine, Mm -hmm. and he titled it, What Palestine Taught Me About American Racism. And it was one of the most powerful pieces. And then he did a music video titled, We Should Be Free, Mm. where he correlates Palestine to remember when all the Charlottesville stuff happened, where they get, like, it's just a mashup, and it's so powerful. Mm. So I'm like, man, this artist is pretty badass. He's a Chicagoan, started listening to some of his music. And then, you know, he was praying next to me at the mosque wow. and he's just another human at that point yeah. we all bow our heads down the same way sure. you know and maybe that was a good spot to meet him mm-hmm. because then I, i'm not like oh my god it's vic i've been listening to him forever mm-hmm. but it's like okay he's just another brother that was praying like, yeah and it was cool we, we were chatting for a bit and uh uh i said to him you box right do you mm-hmm. do anything else and he's like yeah, i do some of this and that what do you do mm-hmm. jujitsu you roll take my number down immediately yeah and we had close friends rami neshashibi is a close friend of ours who i have to like shout out from iman clinic i think this guy can be the mayor of chicago if he wanted to yeah. <laughs> um but so we had a lot of mutual friends so i wasn't some random person so mm-hmm. and i've been trying to get him to go forever And uh, last night, of course, when I rarely had sleep, he decided to say, let's get it. So he came and he's a monster. Yeah, he's good. He has a lot of natural abilities. Mm -hmm. Like he's strong, he's fast, he's Mm -hmm. explosive. uh, That can make him really good once he gets the technique down. Yeah. Of course, he freaks out. Like when I would hold him in certain positions, I had him in a position where I had like a knee on his chest. And, you know, I lightened up. I'm not trying Mm -hmm. trying to teach him. I'm not trying to, you know... Um, come after him and uh, he still handled it gracefully and yeah. calmly and so he's got potential to really be dominant yeah so uh, yeah it was it was cool it was cool hanging out with Vic this morning yeah no kidding yeah. and I and I did a panel with him last two weeks ago really yeah I was on About- a panel with him I got invited by Nico yeah and uh, it was a song he had released that was a version of a Bob Dylan song okay um, based on like I think like war times Mm -hmm. and Nico did it at a church on Damon Avenue Mm -hmm. and it it was a packed house Mm -hmm. I had just gotten back from Istanbul yeah like the morning of and like eight hours later it was me Nico Vic and some other activists doing this panel so I've seen him quite a bit we hang out um, on and off so yeah yeah that was my morning no I mean it's a good morning and I mean Martial arts in some capacity has always been a part of your life. Oh, yeah. Because, what, you're a black belt in... Taekwondo. Taekwondo. Yeah, that was your first, right? Yeah, like, and a blue belt in jiu-jitsu. And a blue belt yeah. in jiu-jitsu. Yeah, which it's way harder to get belts in jiu-jitsu. They pass out belts like candy in Taekwondo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like, okay, well, you've been here for a month. Here's a belt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why is it like that? Is that just the structure uh, of the actual martial art? Yeah, or? yeah. I think uh, I think a lot of it has to do with American culture. 
Oh, we are a society that likes instant gratification. Mm-hmm. And if you're not getting promoted or you're not, you know, getting this next color or something, mm-hmm. then you might quit. And a lot of Taekwondo gyms that were delaying promotions were noticing a lot of their students were dropping off. And those that held promotions a little bit closer noticed that their students stuck around for that next promotion. Because it feels good. It's yeah, a, it's, sure. it's a dopamine rush. It's the next color. It's yeah. another c- color close to black belt. So. Yeah. Uh, but I yeah. mean, isn't the point a little bit too, like the discipline and the, you know, doing yeah. something every day for a long time to yeah. get a bit better type thing? There is, but everybody and their mom does Taekwondo. I feel like, I mean, it's a great martial art and I'm not bashing it mm-hmm. in any way, shape or form. But 90, over 80% of street fights end up on the ground. Mm. And unfortunately, 100% of any sort of sexual harassments that end up in the ER. hmm we're on the ground. Yeah. You know, it's not like it just happens while they're, I mean, yeah, maybe people are standing up and then all of a sudden they get like severely abused. Mm -hmm. Um, So you want a martial art that you can learn how to defend yourself from the ground. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe, I don't even know if you'll be able to correct me. (laughs) Don't worry, someone in the comments will. That's usually how it works out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it originated, like, obviously, uh, jujitsu does not come from Brazil. It comes Mm -hmm. from Japan. Uh, the Brazilians modified it and then they popularized it in the UFC. Mm. But it was kind of like a, one of the, with judo, obviously, they were some of the last martial arts in terms of what do you do if you don't have a weapon or a sword and you find your, your back on the ground, mm-hmm. you know? And I believe it even ages back to like samurai days. Mm. So it's kind of cool to notice the practicality of it back then and still now. Yeah. And even, of course, until now, my professor um, was at 7-Eleven with his kids. Mm-hmm. I think like they wanted a Pepsi or whatever it is. And some guy out of nowhere punched a clerk. My professor just happens to be there. And he immediately saw, it, grabs this dude, pins him, puts him in something called a bow tie where mm-hmm. he held his arm safely for 18 minutes until Chicago police showed up. 18 minutes? Yeah. And this guy's like stuck in this position. Stuck in the position safely. Like he's not feeling choked. My professor was able to like search him and check him. And uh, yeah, it it went viral. It's got like millions of views on YouTube. Got punched? Why did he get punched? I don't know. The guy was drunk. He was harassing people. It was like a 7-Eleven gas station. So Mm. he was harassing people for money. I think the clerk told him you have to leave. Yeah. Pissed him off. I think he came back and punched the clerk. And my professor just happened to be there. That's yeah. wild. And you yeah. said 80% of fights end up on the ground. Street fights. Street fights. Yeah, they'll start standing, you know, sure. but usually when people usually get close, they grab each other. And right. And that's why jujitsu is such like a powerful martial art to learn. Yeah. Because it's all about being on the ground. Yeah, I'd like to think so. I mean, yeah, it starts on the feet, but it's actually all about control. Mm. Like, uh, you know, drunk guy at a bar, drunk guy at a restaurant, you know, if they're harassing somebody, you can easily hold this person down mm-hmm. without hurting them, scratching them, punching them until mm-hmm. somebody else comes. And, uh, yeah, you wouldn't have, you know, caused any bodily harm, which yeah. is cool. You can, even, cool. you can put somebody to sleep and not cause them to be yeah. injured. I mean, that's what the choke the hold is, day, yeah, because yeah, you're yeah, getting you the carotid can, arteries. Yeah, yeah you can like, put somebody to sleep. And, yeah. and by the time they get down on the ground, and then, you know, more people can be on top of them. Yeah, for I sure. don't want to be in those situations. I daydream sure? about yeah. those situations. <laughs> I just don't want to be in them. Yeah. I think it always plays a little bit better in people's heads than it does in real yeah. life. I mean, yeah. I've never been in a fight like that. But, I mean, have yeah. you? Um, yeah, I've been in a couple fights. Street fights? Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, school, street. I mean, the closest thing, the last serious thing that happened to me was on the blue line mm. at UIC Halstead. And I was just waiting for a train to come in some guy maybe he was homeless was like the fuck you looking at man and i was just looking at the train yeah and i'm like hey man i'm good i'm Mm -hmm. good and i'm gonna slit your throat right away goes into his pocket i just wanted to take this is gonna sound really weird i was so tired we had an exam that day the next day and i wanted to take the train yeah from uic halstead to o'hare the shaking Mm -hmm. the noise the people oh like put you to sleep no to like wake me up so i can study like (laughs) i actually took the train to study on the train oh man that's funny and come back because i was falling asleep in the library so i'm like i gotta get out of this so clever it was just i was so (laughs) exhausted but it's not it was two in the morning (laughs) like there's nothing clever about like taking the train to o'hare and back but it was enough stimulation the lights were bright the noise like there was no way i was gonna allow myself to fall asleep on a train yeah um so 
yeah, this guy was like, what the fuck are you going to do, man? And I get in a, like a Taekwondo stance mm-hmm. and put my bag down. He's like, that karate shit ain't going to do it. That karate <laughs> shit ain't going to do it. And he like takes one step forward, two steps backwards. Yeah. Thank God a rent a cop was there. And mm-hmm. like, you know, one of those like, because mm-hmm. it's not like Chicago police. And he came yeah, down just, and the guy left. Yeah, like CTA security or whoever it is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, ironically, the f- previous week in New York City, two homeless dudes got in a fight. Mm-hmm. One of them pushed the other on the, the tracks and killed him. So, oh, and I remember yeah. that. And I remember distinctly saying, don't kick him on the tracks because kicking him registered. And I was following his elbow, not his hand. He kept fiddling his hand. Mm. But the moment, if he would have moved his elbow back, then I knew he was taking something out. And I had like a split second by the time he went like this to be able to get close to him. Oh. So I had this like imaginary line of, you know, if he does pull out, my legs are close enough, but my body's far enough mm. that he can't reach me with his arm. So... And then I was going to jump on the tracks and run because I didn't have the stairs weren't behind me. Yeah. Bruce Lee said the best fight is no fight. He actually ran away from three fights in the Mm. past. That's Bruce Lee. I mean, who would want to fight Bruce Lee, though? I think people want to punk him or some people with weapons. And he Mm. wasn't. uh, I don't think Bruce Lee was that well liked back in the day. You know, he was. Why not? Because he was teaching traditional Chinese martial arts to Americans. Mm. You don't do that. When Bruce Lee was training Wing Chun, he came to the US, mm-hmm. obviously he was trying to start his acting career and he had students like Chuck Norris, Kareem mm-hmm. Abdul-Jabbar, like all these, I guess, celebrities. Mm-hmm. And Bruce Lee went back because he didn't finish mm-hmm. studying martial arts. And when he went back, Yip Man said to him, I'm not gonna teach you. Mm-hmm. And he's like, why not? He's like, you don't teach Westerners. And we're talking about years ago, right? Like yeah. there's still friction between China and the US, Yeah. but we're talking about way back then. Mm-hmm. And Bruce Lee said to him, I'll buy you any home that mm. you want in China. Yeah. And he said, no, he refused. So Bruce Lee came back and started his own martial art called Jeet Kune Do. I know. <laughs> what, it's what, a, so like a combination. It of, was. It was a combination of Western boxing because okay. he was so fixated. Wrestling, um, kickboxing, Wing Chun. Okay. Put it all so, together. Okay, got it. So the word is like a combination yeah, of all yeah, these things. Yeah. Okay, I got yeah. you. So it was cool. I mean, like what, what decade was this? I don't know. What year did Bruce die? Because he I don't know. died like of an aspirin overdose. Didn't he have a headache? Oh, yeah. I think right? it was like, like a weird, like, weird brain bleed or sh- something. Yeah, like, yeah. Which was Odd. suspect. Well, yeah. I mean, Very it's true. suspect. Especially Again, for a seemingly healthy guy or whatever. It wasn't just but. that. I think he had... There were talks, or maybe not, that he was going to eventually start training U.S. military mm. in martial arts. So because that happened, and then all of a sudden this freak accident happened. You think it was? You think I don't it was know. Planned? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> You're like, I don't know. I, don't know. I just saw the trailer for The Crow. Did you see that? No. What is that? Uh, Brandon Lee, Bruce Lee's son, yeah, was killed on The Crow. That's the, the curse of the Lees. Whoa. But yeah, they're both buried next to each other in Seattle. I went to. I'm a big Bruce Lee fan. If okay. You can't tell. Now I got like, it. Yeah, I went to their cemetery site. Yeah. So Brandon is buried next to Bruce. Mm. Brandon was messing around with a. Uh, with a blank mm. and you like put it next to his head and he shot and it still has impact. Like that's there's cr- still pressure. Well, and that's how the person on the Alec Baldwin set rust. No, I thought that was a, that was a live bullet. That was a live bullet. I think it was a live bullet. That's which crazy. Makes no I sense that, that makes there's no a, sense. Yeah. yeah. I, no, because he was just pointing and he shot. Like, I don't think a blank can shoot somebody from that far, Yeah. but he was here. He's with like it. right next to his head. Yeah. Man. And uh, yeah, it was a traumatic brain injury and he died young well, and Brandon was like, on the rise to stardom like yeah. it was george clooney of his time charming yeah. handsome and yeah now they're both buried next to each other wow yeah it's kind of a crazy and now they're remaking the crow and i just saw the trailer for it which I'll it can never be it. the same i know yeah, it can never I'll be the same but if you watch watch brandon lee interviews he's yeah very charming for sure way ahead of his time yeah i was thinking that um i've known you for a long time it's yeah it's been 12 years now yeah almost, thir- it's almost 13 yeah isn't that crazy yeah and I was thinking about, well, you know, I saw that big Mensa post this morning and I was thinking about you and you are like one of the most disciplined people I know. And yeah. I have to think about like where that comes from for you. I mean, we went to nursing school, undergrad together. Yeah. That's a discipline within itself. But then you just like kept going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're a CRNA. Yes. Anesthesia is, I put people to sleep for a living. Yeah. Yeah. Or I pass gas for a living. <laughs> nice. Good one. If my that... patients are anxious, <laughs> I feel bad, man. Usually I lay a joke on somebody like mm-hmm. I had a 30 year old patient yesterday. I'm like, you nervous? She's like, yeah. I said, me too. 
It's my first day. And she like, she's like, don't tell me that. And she like freaked out. Is that a joke that you yeah, do? Yeah, usually that's, people that's, like laugh. That's so, pretty like, funny. That's people, a good one. Like, yeah. it, it depends. It dep- <laughs> you got to read the room a bit. It yeah. depends on the culture. Okay. Like I'm the, if I say it to like an older white dude, he mm-hmm. laughs. He's yeah, like, sure. all right, funny. Yeah, yeah. If I say it to like a middle-aged African-American woman, she's yeah. like, oh, hell no. Yeah, like, and she like wants anything. to get up out of the chair. Yeah. <laughs> but for the most part. Is it they, playful altogether? Yeah, though? 100%. Yeah. Like yeah. it depends. Like I don't even ask people if they have diabetes. I yeah. just say, you got the beatus. And they're like, what's that? Yeah. And they just start laughing. Yeah, there you go. So I try to keep it lighthearted because it's scary. You have you know? to. You're going under anesthesia. And most people aren't afraid of the surgery. Mm-hmm. It's like, am I going to wake up? You know? So anyway. We can I mean, how often that. does that happen where people don't actually wake no, up? No, no, no. People wake up. I mean, we. Every like, time? Every single time. <laughs> every single time i'm not here to like put out misconceptions no no every single time people wake up the only time you see delayed wake-ups are like if you're putting somebody like my mom to sleep Mm. who's never drank an ounce of alcohol in her life for sure who's never smoked an ounce (laughs) of weed in her life (laughs) and like she'll take forever to wake up like you give her like a whiff it's because her tolerance is so low yeah her tolerance is low like My mom was so nervous. They mm-hmm. gave her like a fourth of anything that I give my patients. Yeah. <laughs> she was like smiling, leaving me. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. So yeah. Now anesthesia. I do anesthesia for a living. I mean, so you do mostly inpatient, right? So you work in hospitals. Uh, or... Yeah. I'm all over the place. Okay. I, I'm going to be doing outpatient soon, but mostly inpatient. Yeah. yeah. Sick sick like sick patients or like so sick, like, like so cool. No, like, well, <laughs> both. Yeah. <laughs> Both, but yeah. most of the time, like, I mean, like yesterday I was a neurointerventional and it was, and I know a lot of people like to hear these stories, but it was really sad. Like, I don't know what I would do. Yeah. We had a, a guy and obviously this is not violating any violations. Or, mm-hmm. We're not naming anyone no, or any place. No, of course. Yeah. Uh, older gentleman and um, just early onset dementia. Mm-hmm goes on a walk outside his house, forgets where his house is. He's just walking around on the streets, gets hit by a car Mm. and like traumatic brain injury. And his wife is like right beside him and Mm -hmm. hugging him. And it's just like, this is, this is a tough life. No, that is her life now to take care of this guy. And he just flips on a dime. Yeah. And like, those are exhausting days. Like yesterday I was absolutely drained by the end of it. For sure. Yeah, I think people want to hear those stories. I get, you know, especially, I mean, when I was working more as a nurse, like, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? And I think it's a, it's the same reason people yeah. like true crime documentaries. I'm a little convinced yeah. it's sort of just like, there is something interesting about the human body yeah. at its worst. Yeah. Uh, people might want to mentally prepare themselves yeah. for that situation and someday too of yeah. like, well, if this nurse says this is bad, yeah. then like that's my <laughs> that's my litmus test for like yeah. can I handle something bad yeah. in my life happening? But yeah, it's, it is exhausting. It's yeah, not it's, anything to be proud of, really. Or, it's different. It's different. Like I remember when I was working, I remember we had just so we were mainly ambulance. We had just released the helicopter. Mm-hmm. It was our first day on, and it was a semi truck that T boned a car, and mm-hmm. we can see it from the sky. I think that's. Like from the sky, what do you mean? Because we're coming in from the helicopter. So right. we can so see the is... accident. We see like fire trucks everywhere. Mm-hmm. We see commotion. This is when you were working briefly as Yeah, yeah, critical care transport. Yeah. yeah. So and I did it for like a year and some change. Yeah. Yeah. And um it was just weird. Like mm-hmm. you get nervous. You see you're up there and you're like, damn, there's what am I gonna see? And like the mom is dead in the front seat and the baby baby like four-year-old is screaming in the back yeah having no idea Mm -hmm. like what what's going on um so yeah i mean healthcare is not easy and uh you remember during covid times when uh that hospital Mm -hmm. can we name it no okay let's just not let's not i would love not to break hipaa yeah like no but there was a sign outside of the hospital yeah where it said healthcare heroes yeah there's a lot of hospitals yeah a lot of hospitals and one nurse or somebody stole the r and then it was just healthcare hose Mm. and it was just like (laughs) classic yeah and that was it yeah like sometimes how you feel when you're working like it's it's exhausting it's i mean you've been working you know either bedside rn or crna for how many years now 
even before that, when I was right, doing... Right, because you were like, working yeah, interp interpreter, were interpreter and, in the uh, ER, I'm right? going on 17 years, which is so crazy. That is crazy. Yeah, 17 years in a hospital. I mean, do you think it's... Do you think the landscape itself has gotten more challenging? Or do you think because you've gone through, like, master's degree and you have no, more specialized... No, no. No. Like, do you think it's gotten harder? Or? No, I, I think hospitals have just become more... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? They, I can't speak for all, sure. but economics come before patient care, mm. you know? And I think that's what makes it hard. The production pressures of, okay, we gotta move this patient to get this patient in. We don't have any beds, so this patient's sick, but well enough to go home. Or they're the least sick of the unit, so we're gonna send them home and hope that they don't come back. Uh, just to open up another space, um, a lot of big hedge funds and a lot of big corporations are buying hospitals, so they're playing a hand into all of it too. And everything's becoming so privatized. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what's become difficult. And people are burned out. Yeah. People aren't. People aren't taken care of. Yeah. Like, it's it's a shame that, you know, I can walk into. Meta, I'm talking about like Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. their main facilities in the Bay Area um, because I trained there and my friends were all in tech. And we'd go in a restaurant and I would see no cashiers. Mm -hmm. And they would say to me, um, I would, I'm like, where, where do we pay? Like, oh, you don't pay. You just grab what you want and go out. And this is just anything. Like, what do you want? Middle Eastern, Italian, mm -hmm. Greek? Like, there's a restaurant, Chinese. Mm -hmm. What are you craving? And we have to pay for parking. <laughs> it's crazy. Like we it's, pay yeah. for our own parking. parking. We pay for our own meals. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. we get a cold ass pizza on nurses week or physician week or PA week or EMT week or whatever mm -hmm. it is that your specialty is week. You're lucky if you get a cold pizza, you know? And I, I thought that was a shame. Every floor had fresh fruit, uh, protein shakes, protein bars here. Man, you, you buy a banana, it's like $2 at the hospital. Yeah. You know? So I think, I think a lot of it comes from that too. Yeah. So when people don't feel that they're taken care of, they will naturally not want to work as hard. Right. And people pick up on that. There's, there's an overall vibe that comes with that. So, and, and again, I'm 35 knocking on the door of it, and I've mm -hmm. been in healthcare since 18. Mm -hmm. It has changed significantly. Yeah. Um, Anything for the better, you think, or is it all... Technology, yeah. Sure. Absolutely. So, you know, treatments or prognosis that would be six months is now five years. You yeah. know, different medications. So, yeah, that, that's for the better. I can't say no to that. Sure. Um, but generally speaking, in a hospital setting, I, I, it's, it's been hard, you know. Mm -hmm. So, it's exhausting. It's, exa <laughs> it's, it's, it's fucking exhausting, you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I weave in and out of working in hospitals, yeah. but I mean, even going back to like working at restaurants a couple of days a week, it's like I was looking at the pros and cons being like, okay, nurse, how much am I making an hour? 38 yeah. on average, $38 yeah. an hour. And I go, okay. Yeah, but you have a chance to get spit on, bit, needle stick. Sure. I'm probably like, working night shift for that rate too. Yeah. So, you know, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., three days a week, which, you know, three days a week in theory sounds fabulous. Yeah. In some ways it is. Yeah. But uh, you get your shit really kicked in yeah, sometimes on the first day of three and you of just course. go, okay, we're going back. But yeah, as opposed to, you know, some restaurant jobs, you even get paid more per hour at the end of the yeah. day. And, you know, even right now, it's like, for me, it's like I average 32 to 34 bucks an hour. And it's like, what am I doing? And I, I work 21 hours a week. Like, yeah. And, yeah. I, and that works for me. It's yeah. crazy. And it's like, yeah. it's not even really a place where you can build lo loyalty to a place because no one actually cares about yeah. you. You can you can make more if you go back to school. Right. I don't know. Do some nurses stay in one place and like get paid more? Maybe like University of Chicago, somewhere yeah, union-based? Yeah. There, there, there are unions out there that take care of people. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, obviously, a lot of nurses want to go to California to travel nurse. Right. Because you get higher rates. You don't get shit on with multiple patients. Mm -hmm. um, 
so that is, versus being in Florida, for example, where right. like they don't exist. Right. And the unfortunate thing, hospitals that don't have unions, the moment that a nurse would bring up a union, they'll probably be axed or fired. I right. mean, I know on multiple occasions where that would be the case. Mm -hmm. And of course, everything has its pros and cons. Mm -hmm. But um, at the end of the day, you know, I think U University of Chicago pays their nurses on the third day, like an extra three bucks an hour. Mm. But they noticed the third day call offs reduced significantly once they did that. Like nobody oh, would. Oh, yeah, that's that, interesting. Yeah, that was is, what, it, is it three in a row on the third day or is it just, just the, the third, third day shift in general, no matter the th what? Third shift no matter what. They wow. like, they're like, let's see if this works. And I don't know what it was at the time. Like it reduced by like 70% because that's a big deal, right? Totally. If you're working 12 hour shifts, you're making an extra three to four an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an extra 50 bucks, but it's an extra 200 a month. That's a bill. That's another bill. That's your, that's your groceries for the week or the month. You know, like it is a big deal. People are incentivized by money for a good reason because you need it. And you to know, live. You know, <laughs> just like, you know, hospitals are incentivized by money, yeah. too. And if you yeah. just hand it off to the people, I don't know, like. I mean, you're not the only one that I know. I have so many colleagues of mine who did the ICU thing, mm -hmm. worked in an ICU for three years, went to CRNA school, got doctorates that are now working one day every two weeks doing anesthesia and they're in a real estate. Completely different. Completely different. Like one of my good friends is, he just does one day a week in GI just to maintain his license. Other than that, it's like 100% real estate. And that's kind of the shift. You see, yeah. I mean, look at you. We were talking about me. I love to cook. It's a new yeah. found discovery. <laughs> like, I mean, there's a specific city that I'll be moving to mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. is lacking a specific uh, <laughs> Try not to reveal his identity. I have so not no given my identity away or my secrets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, or your restaurant concept. Or my restaurant concept. <laughs> you know, obviously it's yeah, going to be kind of Middle Eastern. Well, I'm not going to sit there and cook sushi, you know. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know if you know anything about the restaurant business. I know. But you know what the joke is? No. How do you make a million dollars in a restaurant? You don't. You start with two million dollars. What the fuck? <laughs> that's so bad. <laughs> so that's my biggest fear. Yeah. That is my biggest fear. Mm -hmm. Because, like, we all see the success stories. Like, every time I walk into Greek islands, it's packed. In, in here in Chicago? Yeah, in here yeah. in Chicago. Every and time I drive by... That uh, place does rule. That it place does. is awesome. It does. And <laughs> I think a lot of it is their prices are fair. Mm -hmm. The seating is nice. Mm -hmm. It's clean. It gives you a nice environment. But then every time I drive by that place on Augusta, after four years, the Filipino spot... It's like, it's just packed oh, two okay. blocks down. Yeah, Kasama. And I'm like, what the fuck is up with this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go and wait in line now. <laughs> the Kasama. Uh, yeah. The Kasama. I don't want to call it hate because it's not, but it is very hard to order food there. Is and, it? Well, just because you have to wait in line. I know. I can't you do can it. You can order, you can, you know, everyone says order to go and that's the secret for is it. Is it really? Yeah, you can, you can buy it online. I haven't Why been there expand? in a while. Why do Like that makes oh. no sense. If mm -hmm. you're that busy, mm -hmm. move. Get a bigger place. You can make more money if think about it if you have 200 people waiting in line mm -hmm. that you're serving and a lot of people like me are getting turned off mm -hmm. the other day i went to lowe's i stayed there for two hours i came back mm -hmm. i swear to you the same dude that was last barely moved like six feet so if you can get them in and turn them and burn them mm -hmm. you might get more people I mean, I don't think the people is the problem. What it's do you like, think it is? Well, I mean, you, you said if you want to make more money. And it's like, I think they're making fine money the way okay. it is, you know? And yeah. for them, it's like, I'm just trying to imagine if I were them. If I opened another restaurant because I saw the demand was so high at that current restaurant, then you're turning into like a restaurateur. And maybe yeah. that's the goal for them. I don't know. But How long have they been open for? Uh, good question. I want to say three years for I feel so like it was I post COVID. I feel like it I feel like they opened like right at the beginning of COVID. Uh, and and they like got screwed over for a bit. And got screwed over for a bit. But, but then came a yeah. you know, got an epic comeback obviously. Yeah. But it's like you have to ask the question of like what do you actually want? Like maybe they do just want the one location and they're happy with yeah. that. And they have more business than they could ever ask yeah. for. And, and that's freedom and yeah, and maybe, yeah, it's not always ideal for, like, the customer because it's, like, this place is so busy. Yeah. And they do the best they can, but, like... How many tables do they have inside? Mm -hmm. Like 10? 12, maybe. Really? Yeah. And they have an outside patio, they too. They have an right? outside patio. But half the year, that doesn't work. Yeah. 
Well, and they do dinner too. That's so right. That's why they have the Michelin yeah. star because they they don't have the Michelin star for brunch or breakfast. Wow. So they have the Michelin star for dinner, which is fabulous. I have eaten there um, for dinner. Is it pricey? Yeah, it is. Um, What's the per plate per person? Yeah, it's per person. It's a tasting menu. I was gonna um, say so. Wine is a big thing with it. Too. Yeah, you know me. I have yeah. to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was. I mean, the food was great. We had a really nice time. Um, it was probably like after tax and tip though, like 250 bucks, wow. 300 bucks a person. This is how I feel about like pricing, right? Like how much do they make out of that? I don't know. <laughs> but, but I'm always curious. Cause I remember I don't we're know. talking about this like 10% thing that restaurants. Oh yeah. Profit margin. Yeah. Like I find that so hard to believe the, the, cause I the know Arabs won't stick in restaurants at 10%. I just know it. Like, <laughs> well, I, I can't speak for, I can't speak like these for Middle that. Eastern restaurants. I'm yeah. just like, there's no way they're only making 10%. You know, I, I just like the, the stats are crazy, but it's true. Cause you have to think about like how much is overheads, how much is the rent? And then you have a perishable product you're selling. It's not even like owning a wine shop where it's like the bottles can sit there, and they can sit there. for a month. But how, how, once you get into kind of a groove and you know, mm -hmm. Saturdays demand this Friday, Saturdays, Sundays demand this much. Like yeah. I can't imagine you're throwing out that much. Food. Like the day to day operations <clears throat> is not really the thing that makes money for restaurants. It's like private events. Like if you, Catering. if you cater for yeah. weddings and things like that, if you have a separate space for private events and then for a place like Kasama, I have to imagine like they're doing ad deals with Resi because of the bear bump, you know? So yeah. like the bear will promote some of these restaurants and like, you get credit cards, you get wow. restaurant seating software platforms that pay you money to endorse their products. Wow. So it's like you kind of get partnerships and like that's, I think, where you really start making money. It's not the it's not even if you even if you charge fifteen dollars for a croissant, it's like that's not enough to like really make a ton of that's money. That's crazy. Yeah. But it also depends on the ingredients. There's a ton of labor, especially when it comes to pastry. Right, right. You know, those pastry chefs show up at three o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, and they're not done until two o'clock yeah. in the afternoon. And they work yeah. 12 hour shifts too. Yeah. That is crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. And you have to pay those people. And if you want to be equitable, you, you pay them, you know, a good rate, yeah. um, costs money. <laughs> yeah. And you have to, so my philosophy is always like, you should just go to the place that you can afford. I'm never really gonna like slam. I've been trying to be better about like not slam dunking places because of a certain price point. It's yeah. like, if I had fuck you money, I would eat anywhere all the yeah. time, no matter what. Yeah. And I wouldn't think twice about it, yeah. but I don't. Yeah. So it means more. Yeah. Obviously. And I mean, yeah, drop and I'll just, yeah. Dollars, and it's like, like, it was a celebration. It was my birthday. Yeah. Um, I have some friends who worked there and I wanted to check it out. So Were you satisfied fully? Yeah. Like, did you walk out of there saying this was an incredible meal? It was worth it. I had a, I had a very nice meal there. Okay. Um, I've been lucky to eat at a lot of kind of restaurants. And I think when it comes to tasting menu, it feels like a Broadway show. Like it feels a little, it's not just like having a delicious meal. It's like you're presented things in a way that is creative and like you're paying to see sort of almost like the art of the chef. I see. Like I kind of just view it a little bit differently. Like yeah. even though it might not be like the most like delicious thing I have ever eaten, like that's not really what I'm paying for. Yeah. It's like going to see, yeah, like Book of Mormon and yeah. being like, you have to respect the amount of effort yeah, yeah, <laughs> and production yeah. and prep that yeah. went into these people's performance. Yeah. And that's kind of how I feel about this. Yeah. It's like the amount of prep and artistic vision and creativity. Day in and day um, out. Day in and day out. Even like, you know, places like that, they care about the flatware, you know? They yeah. care, they're like, we tried to import, you know, authentic ingredients or authentic, you know, arts to like uh, match the vision that we're trying to create yeah. here or whatever. Um, it's just a different, it's not just dinner, yeah. you know? So I'm just like, okay, that's what I'm paying for. My dad would kill me if I spent 200 on a meal. <laughs> I uh, can't even. Like, sometimes if I go to a place and I spend, like, anything over... Like, my dad... Because my mom is the best cook that I've ever met. Actually, my grandmother is the best cook I've ever met. Yeah. So, like, I took my dad to Greek Islands. He wasn't impressed. I love the place. Oh, man. He, he wasn't impressed? No, because he's like, your mom makes it better. He's like, why'd we pay <laughs> well, for this? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's like, why'd we pay for this? Yeah. You know? What did your mom make when I came over for dinner? Oh, my God. There? Didn't she make like a combination of things? Yes. It was like... Uh, there was definitely a chicken dish, though. They, yeah, it was, it was like, chicken Is and, it Malawi? Is that, or is that... No, was it Makluba? It was Makluba. Yeah, like yeah. she flipped. Yeah. So Makluba, all the word Makloub means to flip. Mm -hmm. So when you say Makluba, it's like flip to it. To flip it. Yeah. yeah. 
So what they do is they put the chicken on the bottom mm -hmm. and then all the vegetables on the bottom and then the rice on top. Right. So when you flip it and then you raise it up, the chicken's on the top and it kind of falls through. And it's just... I'm getting hungry thinking about it. <laughs> I've seen all the, it seems like it's also a very like popular dish to like show off on TikTok it now. Is, too. It is, it is because of the, the performance. The performance. It's, it's a dinner like, and a show. Yeah, it's like knafa, right? It's the yeah. performance, it's the flip, it's the raising and yeah, seeing the, the cheese. cheese cut. Exactly. Yeah. So Ooh. it's all about it. There's actually, there aren't that many restaurants that serve it because. Well, Makluba or Knafa? Makluba or just yeah. traditional Palestinian because you're, typical American or not just your typical American who else mm -hmm. they want shawarma falafel hummus mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. which is like your orange chicken of Chinese food or mm -hmm. your I don't know your tacos of Mexican food mm -hmm. right like that is our kind of street food and that's all they know so when you say hey here's this incredible dish with protein mm -hmm. carbs seasoned amazing mm -hmm. uh, comes with a salad and some yogurt and mm -hmm. um, they're like oh, I don't know it looks a little weird or funny and they're not familiar but there's a place in San Diego that actually put it on its menu and mm -hmm. it does really well. Mm -hmm. But we talk about the prep. It takes hours. It takes a long time. It takes hours. Yeah. And then how many do you make? You make three <laughs> to four. And then how much protein do you have in them? Because there's right. always a little bit more rice and protein. I was thinking about all this. And then even like the, the grape leaves, it's the same thing where you flip it. Yeah. There's a little bit of a show. It takes hours to roll those things. Totally. Sometimes I look at my mom. I'm like, there's 500 in here. You're rolling every single mm -hmm. one. Um, so I don't know. She made that and then she made like, yeah, chicken and I, I, it's just, she's, yeah. I mean, that meal I had at your place was yeah. awesome. I yeah. mean, my mom makes vegetarians stop being vegetarians. <laughs> like, <laughs> she's a wizard. Yeah. Mario came by from Italy. Yeah. And he's been a vegetarian ever since I met him. Like mm -hmm. when we were doing work in Greece and Lebanon, he never mm -hmm. had a single and I'm sorry to offend any vegetarians out there. <laughs> he like smelled it. He's like, yeah. he's like, this smells so good. He's like, okay, I'll have a small piece. And yeah. just ends up destroying right. it. Like, <laughs> he felt bad afterwards. He's like, that was the first time I had chicken in years. Yeah. Um, so, it's yeah. A, it's int I mean, it's this, this idea has been brought up a couple of times in this conversation, starting with Bruce Lee, about like, he was trying to teach traditional Chinese martial arts yes. to an American clientele. And yes. it was like, mm, you got to change it. Yeah. You know, and I think that I think Chinese food is a good example where it's like the more maybe like traditional, maybe authentic is the word Chinese yeah. food that you'd see and that immigrants would bring over. It's like, mm, no, like no. we need the sweet, like, the sour. We, we would the, like the general yeah. sows or the um, orange chicken. Yeah. And like it's it's, um, you know, it's like a hybrid of like just trying to adapt and trying to make money in, yeah. the, in America. But I also feel like that maybe they're the counterculture, maybe Anthony Bourdain sort of kickstarted, uh, kickstarted this too of like, we would much rather as a culture, maybe have the more authentic thing these days yeah. or the more like what you would actually eat in these countries and yeah. not like trying to appease a certain clientele. But I don't know if that's just like in my little Chicago bubble, you know, because yeah. it's like, we are a pretty global city. We have lots of different kinds yeah. of people. And I think yeah. more people are just understanding of that. Yeah. But I wonder if a place could really thrive in, I don't know, like Little Rock, Arkansas or something. You but know? I've been in those places. Actually, so funny. Anthony Bourdain came to our gym to train jiu-jitsu because uh, he's a blue belt. What do you mean our gym? Uh, the gym that I train at, the Red Zivix. Really? Well, yeah, when he came to do the Chicago episode. Yeah, Whoa, I mean, yeah, cool. and him and Adri yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, he's like the nicest guy. Yeah. Yeah, he is. Oh. God rest his soul. Truly. I, I mean, he. what an inc And he was super pro-Palestine and like mm -hmm. really well aware of I everything. Mean, yeah. For sure. so, I saw that episode. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was it was yeah. really interesting. And then he continued to speak on it. Like yeah. he's won multiple awards, but I don't know if they would because I've worked in those places where I would like take a contract in the middle of the country where I'm the darkest dude in the whole town, mm. and um, they don't know. Like, they're like, what's your food like? And you say shawarma. Hum oh, I've had hummus, like maybe. Mm -hmm. some off-brand but they don't know anything else mm -hmm. so I, I don't know if it would yeah. like I think Mexican food yes um, but even then and, and I'm not bashing these other places but having Mexican food in Chicago mm. versus having Mexican food in like Watsika Illinois mm. is so different mm. like it's like I'm not even Mexican I'm like no this is not good Mexican food <laughs> because I've had it here so sure. it's 
It's like super bland. I can't explain it's just it. Bl- I mean, it might not even just be good food. Yeah. Point blank but too. To it's them like, it is though. Mm. So it just goes to show you like exposure and experience, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, I don't know. We are a melting pot of a country, but yes, of course, some more rural places, you're going to have more like, like uh, similar kinds of people being together, yeah. whether they are white or Somalian, yeah. like Minneapolis. But I mean, yeah. I keep using big cities as an example. Yeah, well, yeah. It's like, well, you just get groups of people who go there and like, how do we, I want, I want the experiment of like, which thing do people really like better? Like, would people like Makluba or yeah. do people just want to do hummus? The traditional, yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. You know? I don't know. It's, you know, but even when you make your own foods, you're like, I make, I think probably one of the best lentil soups that I've ever had. And, it is very good. Yeah. And, and every time I make it, people, what's the recipe? How did you do it? What yeah. Is it? And they're just, they, they, I look up and it's gone. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, uh, Ben was, he went to some restaurant, I don't know, here in Chicago, mm-hmm. Middle Eastern. He had lentil soup and I'm like, is that good? He's like, yeah, but you wouldn't think so. You know, he's like, it's okay for me. He's like, it's not as good as yours, mm-hmm. but you wouldn't think so. And it's interesting because the standard is different. I'll tell you something. Some of these Middle Eastern restaurants on the north side would go broke on the south side. And they're Palestinian owned. They would, and, and, and maybe this is a very, uh, what do you, controversial statement. They would absolutely go broke because their food doesn't even come close to food in like Bridgeview, AKA Little Palestine. Mm. Or if you go to Dearborn, which is, holds the highest concentration of Arabs in the U.S. wouldn't. But you show up here on the north side, it's packed yeah. to the brim. Why is that? I, I don't know. I don't, maybe population. I'm not saying it's not good. Mm-hmm. But I'm just saying, even if, if I put you and I had you taste both mm-hmm. and I didn't tell you which one came from which, right. you'd immediately say, I like this one. Sure. And then I guarantee you it would be connected to the south side. Mm. And, and I don't know if it's like, maybe they have to step their game up. Like mm-hmm. restaurants in Chinatown, they're very good. Mm-hmm. Where, and I'm talking about old Chinatown. Because if they're not, then they're going to lose their own people and their own clients mm-hmm. of sort. Am I making sense? Yeah. I you mean, know? Yeah. Um, because I would go to the restaurants here. I don't want to name any names. And I would eat from them. And I'm like, man, I was just that. And I will name this name. Niall on 87th in Harlem. Mm-hmm. And even my friends, my American friends, this was after my jiu-jitsu tournament Saturday, you know, had that food. And they're like, this is the best hummus I've ever tasted. Mm-hmm. This is the best insert whatever it is I've ever tasted. Yeah. So it's not just me. Like they've eaten on the north side. They live in Lakeview. They live, you know, in Lincoln Park, all these other places. Mm -hmm. But the moment that they had it here, these were the comments that came out of them. Yeah. I don't know why is that. I I would have easily guaranteed they would say that. Yeah. Knowing my palate. But even they were able to distinguish it at the time. Yeah. Maybe because they didn't know any better. I know you keep mentioning bigger cities and and to tie it up. Yeah. Watsika, Illinois doesn't know any better. Mm-hmm. So if like that's the Mexican spot that they have versus us having one of the highest populations of Mexicans in the country. Yeah. It's a different story, you know? Yeah. And it's like, I wonder if like people go to these restaurants and they have an affiliation, you know, maybe because they are Mexican or they are Palestinian and they're like, well, my, you know, my grandma makes it like this, yeah. you know, and like yeah. maybe they have a, a true opinion yeah. about it and have a nostalgia factor yeah. tied to it. And maybe it is just truly a better recipe because people are saying like maybe giving feedback or yeah. maybe it is just like inherently a better recipe, whatever that means. It could just yeah. be like there's more salt in it. So it yeah. just tastes better. Yeah. Or there's yeah. more lemon juice. Yeah. It's hard, so it tastes it's like, hard to give feedback though. I was in Vegas climbing. Yeah. And I was like, I got to find a Middle Eastern restaurant. I found one. Yeah. I knew the first red flag is like it was like at this like janky place, but it had a lot of good reviews. Mm-hmm. So I tried it and the guy goes, this is going to be the best falafel sandwich you've ever had. And I'm like, <laughs> pretty high expectation. To very, especially that yeah. I've lived in Palestine. I'm yeah. like, dude. Uh, and it was it was OK. It was OK. Yeah. But he fully believed this was his. What did you think? And mm-hmm. I couldn't. You didn't tell him. I couldn't. I couldn't be like, my man, I've had like 10 that were better. (laughs) And they're like, fuck is all day up. Yeah, for sure. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And he was so convinced. I'm like, it's great, man. It was good. Because like, 
you know, 99% of his customers Mm -hmm. were people that were gambling away and just like at the slots, eating a sandwich and playing pool. I just I highly well, doubt that many Palestinians walk into his spot. Sure. You know? Well, I think that's a maybe that's a good point too. If like sometimes like people just eat at a place because it's purely convenient and it just sounds good at yeah, the time, yeah, you yeah. know. And you're like, yeah. you know, I think particularly with Middle Eastern food in general, there, you know, it's just more vegetable forward. It's yeah. just like there's more dietary fiber. There's just yeah. like things about it where people deem it healthy, yeah. you know. And it's yeah. like. I want something Very tasty, vegan, and vegetarian friendly, vegan, vegetarian friendly, yeah. diet friendly. Yeah. You know, like there's not. We give our cardiac patients a Mediterranean diet. True. <laughs> They're the only ones that get it. Yeah, Everybody true. else gets Oreos. Oh yeah, true. <laughs> <It's just> like... <laughs> so Everybody else gets yeah, jello and yeah. chicken noodle soup. So yeah, I think like maybe it is just a convenience factor yeah. for people, just being like, hey, it's in my neighborhood. Yeah. Um, I've heard okay things. Yeah. Maybe I give people, uh, I don't know, I think of people like my brother, who's like, love the guy, but like he could eat a cheeseburger for the rest of his life. And it could, Daily. and it doesn't even need to be like the best cheeseburger yeah, in the world. Be. Yeah, he just likes it. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe that's just how most well, people, like maybe Americans, we can generalize pizza that. Pizza is the people. number one eating food in America. Yeah. It's pizza. Oh, and the thing about pizza is like even a bad pizza, you're like, yeah, yeah, it's still pizza. Yeah. It's like you know, better. You know, it's like yeah. it's like sex. It's like well, you yeah. still had sex. It yeah. wasn't great, but like but it's, oh, still, it's still good. It's still I'm pretty satisfied. Good. I'm full. Yeah. So I mean, maybe it's the same thought process of like maybe people like you and me. Yeah. You know, I love going out to dinner. Yeah. I love trying new restaurants and finding my yeah. favorite, what I think is the best, and that's like something I enjoy yeah. and put money into. I don't buy fancy handbags. I don't yeah. buy designer clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I pay for rent and I and yeah. I go out to dinner. Like but those are the things I like to do. Some restaurants really stick out for life. Remember when we were doing that, uh, the women and children's uh, food, clothes, toy drive. Yeah. What yeah. year was that? Two thousand. That was like fifteen 14, or sixteen. 15? Yeah. I, think I was back from Greece at the time, but it was in the, it was in uh, fifteen. Okay. I think it was in December. Yeah. That was almost 10 years ago, yeah, but we went, to to that, we went to a Thai spot. I, I, every time I drive by that Thai spot, I think I you know. had not Yeah. until like <laughs> two months ago. When yeah. we drove, I'm like, I think this is it. And I yeah. took a photo of it. And I'm like, we have to come back here. <laughs> but could you imagine how good it was to be that ingrained in us mm-hmm. to nine years later? Think about it. I still think about a spot in Vancouver, yeah. a Palestinian restaurant that I had food at that I would love to go to. Yeah. I still recommend whenever my friends go to... Uh, Hawaii in Oahu mm-hmm. to go to this place and I'll give him a shout out Cal <laughs> at Waffle and Berries because he was so nice and the some of the best waffles I've ever had in my life yeah were made right in front of me from this like small stand it wasn't even a restaurant you walk in and there's multiple restaurants in this place and then there's like a cafeteria That's and perfect. That sounds like good. I think about it now and I'm like yeah. I want to go back to have that experience again. sure you know how much of that is environmental though like when you mentioned that Thai spot, we went to Sarah's Circle, which is an uptown. That yeah. was the women's shelter. Yeah. We had a long day. Yeah. We had done something good. Right. And I so think, we were feeling good. Dopamine I, I, was I think we, yeah, we had some serotonin flowing. Yeah. And we were like, it was like you and me, like buds hanging out. Yeah. And it was like, it was just a really good day. Yeah. And then being like, well, let's just try this Thai spot. Yeah. And like maybe the Thai spot is just okay or like yeah. is, is good. We it might not go be like, I mean, I mean, maybe. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's also right. the think, culmination. Yeah. And in like, you know, in Hawaii, it's like, well, I'm in a beautiful place. Yeah. I've also have, maybe I went surfing that day. Yeah. Maybe I went yeah. on a hike, you know, yeah. like maybe I have good. other things that make, yeah. I, maybe I'm there with someone like yeah. I really care about and that yeah. means something to me. And then you go have this like pancake and you're like, dude, well, yes. Well, yeah, like, it's funny because I mean, look, God bless Anthony Bourdain. I mm-hmm. usually try to chase whatever restaurants he's gone sure. to. Yeah. So like in Rome, I went to the place and mm-hmm. it was good. But I think it's become so commercialized because he's gone there that the quality's gone down. And it's like, possible. I sat in his seat in Istanbul at the small like cafe yeah. that he ate at. And I'm like, yeah, sandwich is all right. But yeah. I think like maybe it lost some quality from, from back then to now because the episode was like 10 years ago. Sure. Maybe some of it is that. I think yeah. you're right. Just like sometimes food tastes better yeah. in the right scenario. And it's like you can't sell that or quantify that. Yeah. And it's hard to trust people on that all the yeah, time. Yeah, but there's there's always great scenarios where you're on a date with somebody and mm-hmm. it's great and everything's going well, but then mm-hmm. the food comes out bad. You know, yeah. like <laughs> sure. there's only so much like yeah. th- those environments can okay. be. Okay, okay. And then you get the food and you're like, damn. Because I'd rather pay $100 for a bite 
than five dollars for a whole ass plate for a big plate yeah that yeah. doesn't taste good yeah well you can't get much for five dollars right? yeah you can't even get I, mcdonald's for five bucks anymore but they're like experiences like every time i go back to san diego i was in a restaurant there middle eastern but there's many so i'm not going to name it and like i could have swore the chicken was just a little undercooked mm. and him being middle eastern and me being middle eastern this waiter grabs my fork mm -hmm. puts it in the chicken mm -hmm. takes a bite and he's like, no, it's pretty good. And just puts the chicken back. Off your plate? Off my plate. He ate it off and your plate? And I'm like, what just happened here? Like, this is... What was he trying to prove? Like, that just, the chicken was, was cooked. Because yeah. I'm like, hey, I think it's a little undercooked. You know, but, he I, did it, but he did it in front of you for a reason, yes. don't you think? I think like, he was just like, hey... Don't fuck with me? No, it was more like, hey, I'll show you that it's not... I, like, no, let me try it. He's okay. like, it was more of like, no, I was no, like, no. if I'm going to eat it, you yeah. can eat it. Yeah, because we were going back okay. and forth. I'm like, no, no. He's like, he's like, Habibi, I think it's, oh, you gotta... it's cooked. Yeah, he gave... <laughs> oh, he started with the yeah, Habibi. Yeah, he threw the Habibi. He's uh, like, no, okay. it looks cooked, man. There's yeah. a little char. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not cooked. And I like took a bite. Mm -hmm. I put it down. I'm like, man, it doesn't taste cooked. Yeah. He's like, let me see. And he like grabs my fork, takes a bite and puts it down. And I'm like, I can't pay for this. Yeah. I've never done that at a restaurant yeah. but that. Okay. And sure enough, we... It was the day where I had to fly. <laughs> I already, already can tell where this is going. I rode the plane on the way to San Diego. Yeah. I, my seat was bathroom <laughs> rear on the way back. Yeah. I was there for at least, man, I sat in the, that, it was a four hour flight back. I was in the bathroom for at least three hours. It was just take off and landing so that he I was, was not occupying the toilet. He was probably it doing fucked the same me thing. Up. It, yeah. He was probably doing the same thing. Maybe, I don't know, we just got guts of steel. Yeah, but. I'm, yeah, but ch it's chicken, right? I can see, like, yeah. meat. Like, I'm pretty particular with the meat. I've sure. grown up with it being well done or medium well, so I'm like, that's it. Whenever I see raw, mm -hmm. I, like, freak out. I think I'm going to get sick. Mm -hmm. uh, but chicken I don't fuck with. Like, yeah. you, that has to be cooked. Like, sometimes I'll overcook my chicken just to, <laughs> just to make sure I'm still traumatized from this moment, you know? And, yeah, yeah, that's fucking crazy but that but i wouldn't go to that restaurant i mean i was in san diego for last ramadan and it was a group of 10 of us and somebody's like this place i'm like no and that was 10 years ago the dude's probably man, gone man. and yeah. even then it just like and, and it, i think it goes back to the limbic system in the brain love the, I, I love talking about so, the limbic so system. yeah the limbic <laughs> system because i think the there there are obviously multiple areas where memories can be stored but there's a specific area where we interpret smell that's so close to the area where memories arise. That's why, like, whenever you smell somebody's perfume or your grandmother's perfume, you think of those places. This is why whenever I walk into a Middle Eastern supermarket, immediately my mind goes back to Palestine because it's the same smells, the same herbs. What, the is same... It, what does it smell like? What it's does just, Palestine smell like? Oh, man. It's like a mix of, like, fresh olive oil. <laughs> like, if I had to sum it up. And then... The soap that olive oil is made from, uh, every spice that you can think of, because we are a culture of multiple spices, and just like fresh fruit, mm -hmm. fresh produce, like I, I just I can't even. It smells like my grandmother's home. Yeah. Like I can't even describe it. Yeah. Like, it's just like it makes me smile yeah. thinking about it. You know. The limbic olfactory like proximity is something like, I talk. I talk about. It, they're right next to each other. Yeah. I talk about it all the time with, with what, wine. Totally, because it's, it's the same thing. Because when people smell a wine, the joke, you know, you're in a tasting and someone asks you, "Okay, what do you smell in this wine?" And then you just forget everything you've ever smelled in your entire life when you're put on the spot like that. Yeah. I'm like, but I think some of the most complex memories and smells are so innate and we don't realize yeah. it. Like you just described a place yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you used many things to do that yeah. and it is a combination and you can't even say it's 10 percent <laughs> fresh fruit and 20 percent mm -hmm. this no it's like everything it's yeah it's the emotional and the memory and the olfactory yeah. are so close and it's like we start there and then how i teach people is like we have to kind of reverse engineer it Interesting. and like think about you just did it you have a you have more of a knack for it than other people but as a culture, we don't smell things and think about, <laughs> we don't smell things and think about smelling things. We use our eyes, we use our ears, we yeah. touch things, we even like taste things. Yeah. But like, we don't practice smelling. There's no, only no, so many no, cultures right. that like, I. there are board games in France, like children's games, where it's 
it looks like Candyland, but you uh -huh. you smell things. Really? And like you only progress if you correctly guess the smell. <laughs> Why don't we do that? What's the point? We don't we don't do a lot of things if it doesn't I don't know. You know. Make us money. <laughs> yeah, but we, like, we don't realize it until we lose it. We lose our sense of smell, which is connected to our sense of taste. Yes, that's true. For like true. COVID, for example. That and now is all of a sudden true. you're like, I can't taste the food or I can't smell. And then you realize, okay, mm -hmm. you know, now you're fucked. Yeah. It seems like a, um, it seems like a luxury thing to yeah. think about, you know. Like, I mean, it is the first sense I would give up. Like if somebody yeah. said to me, you can give up your eyesight, your hearing, your touch, mm -hmm. your vision, you know, yeah. your taste. What would you give up? I'm like, I'd probably smell. smell. Oh, yeah, I want to hear, I want to see, I want to mm -hmm. touch. Like, mm -hmm. I would, it would probably be that. But wouldn't you want to give up taste first? Because what you taste isn't 80% of what you taste actually what you smell. I don't know, actually. I think that's the stat. Like, if, you, actu really? if you actually just now like... I'm thinking about the nerves. If you just like, it, yeah. You know, I don't know. Because like people, COVID affects the smell because, well, we don't really actually know why yeah. it like causes that. But like just think about when you have a cold and your sinuses yeah. are flared right. up. Right, you don't taste. You don't taste yeah. because your sinuses, not because yeah. your like mouth is swollen yeah, or your taste buds true. don't work anymore. That's it's like, true. It's really just inflammation of the yeah. nasal I'm canal. curious, I have to ask an ENT friend about that because when you think of like where do you, where like on the part of your tongue where bitter is tasted. I've heard that's a like myth. Sweet. Is it really? Yeah, like those tasting zones really? are a myth. Yeah, or I'll like have to look into that. It's it's more integrated. It's not as pretty and like cut out as like you've seen yeah, the diagram like, of the yeah. tongue where it's like yeah, really? bitter, sweet, sour. Yeah, apparently it's. I all. mean, you would. I mean, you've kind of it's dove like a, into this. Well, a you know, bit it's just wine. like I'm. Yeah, exactly. Well, then healthcare too. I'm yeah. like accidentally working ENT. Yeah. <laughs> oh really? I, well, <laughs> just think about like the things I talk about and how they connect. But yeah. Yeah, definitely in limbic system and how that connects too. But yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Do you know anyone with long COVID? Yeah, no. One of my friends, and and <clears throat> look, some people didn't even know they had COVID. Mm -hmm. Some people had a minor cold. I got it for the first time in Costa Rica. COVID. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt just nauseous, mm -hmm. and I'm like, this can't be it. But I was so worried because. The family that I had been living with for a couple months, mm -hmm. I've gotten to know and love and just, you know, they were at such a pivotal point in my life. My grandfather died in Palestine. Mm -hmm. They were there. Yeah. You know, it wasn't my own family. So I really cared about them. And I'm like, shit, do I have COVID? Do I not? So I mm -hmm. went to go get tested. And I'm like, of course, positive. Yeah. I was running on the third day. Yeah. Like I was back on like my running routine on mm -hmm. the third day. I felt a little achy and... I didn't feel 100%, but it felt like a bad virus. Yeah. Whereas I know somebody personally. Mm -hmm. um, he was a nurse at a hospital that I worked at and that Ben worked at. I mm -hmm. didn't. He took care of my father, this particular nurse. Yeah. When he went, and, it's, and he's been on the news, so it's not like I'm giving up his name, but when my dad went to go get his colonoscopy, he's like, I got you. I'm going to take care of your dad. COVID hits, GI shuts down, elective cases, you know, nobody's going to do a colonoscopy when there's overflow of ICU beds and whatever it is. So he's like, I'm going to go and help out in the ICU. And this dude ate clean. Um, I don't remember him eating even sweets, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke. He was a marathoner or a runner. He gets it. He gets COVID. And then he gets so bad where he was in the ICU, but he refused to get intubated. And then eventually he was intubated. And then he died. He was, he was on the news. They, he was the first nurse in the Chicagoland area, the first healthcare worker in the Chicagoland area to die of COVID. So it's like, you know, and then you have the long-term people like my boss or one of my bosses um, uh, who has a friend he was telling me about <clears throat> and he had to have post-it notes all over the place. Yeah. Because he was forgetting things. It was like Guy Pierce and Memento. Right. You know, so. I never heard that side effect. That yeah, yeah. There, there, are, there, are, there are people that have that. Because we don't really know a lot about long COVID, right? No, just like a lot of people. So you just don't know. You don't know if like this cough is because you were a smoker and like that set you off. Sure. Or our environment's not the best. Or allergies. Mm -hmm. Or if it was COVID. 
Yeah, we just don't know. I mean, it's it must be hard having long COVID. I think that would be the hardest part is yeah, not having suck. any answers on like kind of what to do next. Yeah, you just treat symptoms. Like yeah. if your lungs it's are true. inflamed, it's steroids. If yeah. like there's no like fixing it. You know, there's Not no now. being like, we understand a root yeah. cause. Even yeah. I mean, maybe people would argue that like, since it's viral, it's just a general inflammation. Yeah. So like treating yeah. inflammation, yeah. but treating inflammation usually means you're fixing core problems yeah. too. And sometimes uh, it's not even their fault. Yeah. Sometimes people yeah. eat well and drink turmeric and yeah. you know, but pineapple I, juice. And but I still... do recommend a high vitamin C. Yeah. Diet. Like I'm always about vitamin C, B, C and zinc. Yeah. A hundred percent. They all need each other. Like mm -hmm. if you take zinc without vitamin without C and B, it doesn't work. Yeah. You know, if I don't you take, think people know that. Too. Yeah. But if also if you take a ton of vitamin C without vitamin B, it's not going to be as effective. Like you have to do it in combination. Mm -hmm. The only thing I warn people is don't take vitamin B in the evening because it's like a natural stimulant. Yeah. You know, if you look at like some of these Red Bull cans, like you can <laughs> see some of the vitamin B is like 300 so. percent. Yeah. It'll keep you up a little bit, but it's nice because if you take it in the morning, it acts like a natural energy booster. Right. So, well, if you have ADHD, though, then all that goes out the window. Yeah. Yeah. Which <laughs> None of that stuff works. Yeah. I mean, which I don't know if that's even like I have a lot of patients that have ADHD. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a lot of kids with that, too. And I'm just like, they're just being kids. I don't know at what point if it's getting overdiagnosed. Not that I have a mental health or psychology background, so I can't mm -hmm. state that. Like, if I told somebody about who I am, they would diagnose me with ADHD. I get fixated on one thing, nothing else matters, mm -hmm. but then, you know, I'm doing a million things at once, and it's like, no, it just, I've, when I put my mind to something, I put my mind to something. Right. And it's always worked for me in the past, mm -hmm. and it's how my grandfather raised me in Palestine, you know? Sure. So. Yeah, and I mean, I think also, like, part of these diagnoses is that, like, it needs to also affect your daily living, yeah. right? Negatively. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, right. and I think I I wonder, I mean, I have I've been diagnosed with ADHD and yeah. I'm just like, I've always been a shit test taker. Yeah. And there's things where yeah. I'm like, yeah, maybe maybe that should have been easier. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it wasn't just like I needed to, you know, work harder. Right, right. <laughs> like you maybe put there it was in the work. Yeah, and I just still could never yeah. perform. I only got through nursing school because of you. I don't know about that. <laughs> Just like the peer pressure, like peer pressure yeah. that I got from my friends of just being like, we're studying right now, we're doing it. Yeah. You lending me your car so, yeah. I, can, but, <laughs> so I could go to my class. We would have fun studying though. It wouldn't be like this like crazy, like we'd just pop in a wormhole and just like chill. I couldn't do the note card thing. I couldn't like, I get anxiety. I've done well in school all my life. I get anxiety when I see a group of people with note cards and no, I'm just like, shit, I can't do this. Like, yeah. I need to like go to a cafe and just like read out you of just, a book. You just yeah. read it and then yeah. you're like. And I'll read it over and over and over. I don't care if I have to read it a million times. Yeah. Sometimes I thought to myself, I'm like, why am I reading this so much? Right. It's not sticking. Do you have to, do you have to teach it to people sometimes? Uh, like, cause you do a lot of tutoring. I so. do now. Yeah. I'm tutoring, um, pathophysiology and pharmacology fun <clears throat> yeah yeah it's, well, maybe it's, not the pharmacology but yeah no but it's 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 a lot of fun i mean it's it's cool to really understand how the body works yeah you know uh sometimes i get made fun of by you know some of my friends that i i don't know my car dies or something and i can't figure it out and they're like oh what you, you're not man enough and i'm like dude I, like i put people to sleep and wake them up for a living when their body organs are getting manipulated mm -hmm. and they have no idea they look at me and they're like we're done Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. as if nothing ever happened like mm -hmm. that. That's what I dedicated my life to. That's what 10 years of my life were spent for. Well, you can also, you know, put people out on the street too. Yeah, yeah. I can. I can. That's my, that's my you thing. Can, you can do it all. I can put people out on the street. I have yet to put somebody to sleep in a tournament. But I've been tapping a lot of people out in tournaments. Do you lose points if you, like, no. if there's like. No, if, they got to tap. Yeah. Like that's, you sign a waiver. Yeah. Like, you know what you're doing. They know what they're doing. They do know. Pe do people like break bones at any of these? Or if like they don't tie, I almost took a dude's ankle home with me the other day. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Like, it would have been a souvenir next to my gold medal. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying it that way. Like, if he didn't tap, he was such a nice guy. Yeah. Because in the middle of the finals match, I, he was kicking my ass. Mm. I'm not going to lie. Like, mm -hmm. this dude was a little bit short, a lot shorter than I was, but like, stocky, muscle, wrestler. Mm-hmm 
lower to the ground. I couldn't do shit against this guy on, on the feet. So I try to take him down. He sits on top of me. I'm like, fuck, I'm already down 3-0. Yeah. So then I flip him over. He comes back. Finger in my eye pokes me and then his head slams into my head and immediately like I started seeing blurry and my eye started to tear up So the ref stopped the match yeah. <laughs> Medics came in and it was just my eye and the medics like can you tell me where you are and I'm like yeah Yeah, I'm, yeah. In, I'm in Bedford Park. Like, can you tell me what day it is? I'm like, yeah, I'm a no times three <laughs> and he, <was> just like, <laughs> he starts laughing. I'm like look you have some saline like flush this thing out. I, mm-hmm. I can't see that well and then I just started blinking a little bit and I think my eye was just tearing up mm-hmm. uh, so naturally it was the saline and I was already like so adrenaline up I'm usually so calm I look at my opponents they're so intense they're like music and heads down and they're bobbing and they're serious yeah and I'm like looking at my teammates and I'm like you know like <laughs> smiling and and the moment the ref says you know he'll like wave people to come in I just walk very calm mm-hmm. like say a quick prayer shake hand and we go so yeah i i grabbed this dude's ankle uh he ended up like again sitting on top of my chest popped him up grabbed it again it was i was extending so much and then the moment i went like turned my stomach in i almost hipped out thank god he topped because you don't want to injure anybody you don't go into it to injure anybody you go into it to compete and you want you and your opponents to come out safe like because most of the people I'm facing are people with jobs and people that have families and people that are doing this for whatever reason, whether it's like competition sport, they want to compete at a national level, um, they want to gain points to compete in Vegas, which is where the huge tournament is, uh, Masters Worlds. Uh, you don't know. But yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mainly go after joints. Like that's my big thing. So like, Elbow joints, shoulder joints. Is that a common strategy or? Uh, that... Yeah, I've just become really good at some of those. Okay. Uh, those techniques. And uh, also I'm a climber. So I have like right. really good grip strength. Right. So the moment I kind of get a hold of somebody's lapel and gi, mm-hmm. I usually give them like one quick hard push because it fucks with people. Yeah. There, there's <laughs> this like, damn, he's strong. Got it. And I, I even do some, I do some dumb stuff in the warm up. They put us in this area called the bullpen. So we'll check in, we'll check our weight. And then it's just 40 dudes in like a 20 by 20 <laughs> waiting to be called. So everybody's anxious, headphones, you have no space. And I always do this thing where I'll do push ups, but since I can do the splits, I'll do like one sided splits. You and can I do can, the splits? Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. Since when? Yeah. Since I can recall, it's been a You're just year. kind of a flexible guy. No, I, I had to work for it. Okay. Like I used to, one of my friends, Mohammed, he's a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. We used to like sneak into the mosque and just stretch for like an hour at mm. two in the morning. Uh, his uncle used to train with Chuck Norris's cousin, Stefan. Crazy. Who he would call Stephanie because of his accent. <laughs> just, Stephanie, come here. <laughs> like every single time. But uh, so I would do this weird thing where I would do push ups and I can see my opponents. And I know when my opponent Googled me too. They always Google. I mean, he like looked at me and I can tell him, like, you know, you know, <laughs> you know yeah. me. So I'll get down, I'll do some push ups and extend my leg out, do some crazy shit that I would never do on the mats. Yeah. But my opponent, sure enough, came after, after the match. He's like, fuck, man. He's like, I saw you warming up. I saw your flexibility. He's like, fuck, what is this dude going to do? So there's a little bit of a mental I'm a, warfare. I'm a mind game, I imagine. A little bit. And a like when bit. you Google someone before a match like that, like what do you look for? Just like if they've won before? Yeah, or like yeah, what kind yeah. of training they have? Yeah, or like, yeah. So okay. the usually a lot of these places will have your record online. Mm-hmm. So like I have two different forms. One is through the IBJJF, which is the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation. So if you look me up there, you just see two first places. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is smooth comp, which it holds your record as well. And I'm four and one in that. Nice. Some people keep it private. I keep it public. Yeah. <laughs> you want people to I know. I keep it public. And my main photo is a gold medal <laughs> at a different tournament. So, I mean, it's all just fun and games at the end of I the mean, day. I mean, well, you, know? you, you just won a tournament, didn't you? I did, you? Saturday. Yeah, Congrats. Just, thank you. Yeah. So, I didn't think I was going to win that one. Oh, come on. You no, must- I really, I got sick. I had a, I, the week prior, I got sick and... Um, you know, and then like Ben was mad at me. He's like, you got me sick. I'm like, how'd I get you? It's not like I like sneezed in your face, but I just felt like shit. I didn't train. And I was like, you know what? 
I'm going to go in. I was hesitant. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I tested no negative for COVID multiple times because I don't want to get anybody sick. Yeah. And then Thursday, I did some cardio. But uh, I just thought, you know that quote? It's like the person who shows up to the arena is more brave than the person who doesn't show up at, at all. all. You know, I can't tell you how many times I was the dumbest person in the room. I can't tell you how many times I was the brokest person in the room. I would go to these like real estate meetups. And I was by far the brokest person. I didn't understand it. And the dumbest too. I didn't understand the terminology. I would ask questions when they're like throwing stuff out. Like, what's your cash on cash? Whatever these like mm -hmm. slang terms for, uh, you know, why you would acquire or not acquire a building. And I would just sit there like, what are they saying? And oftentimes I wouldn't be dressed up. You know, they'd have on some nice pants and shiny uh, shoes. And I would just like have on some Chuck Taylors and mm -hmm. shoes and like, a, a vest that I would buy from like a thrift shop, you yeah, know, and, sure. uh, and but I, I got used to that. I think that's that's been key to my success. This tournament could have gone so bad for me in so many ways, and I knew it. Like, you know, you talk about how you asked me earlier if I've ever been in a real fight. These are it. Like, these are guys that have been training that know what they're doing like a real fight if the guy doesn't have a weapon he doesn't know what the hell he's doing he's gassing out in 30 seconds i don't worry about a guy in the street that doesn't have any training or that's barking and as long as you don't have a weapon on you i'm not worried mm -hmm. these guys i'm worried about because they they're training they're they're lifting they're doing all this plus they have this adrenaline rush which gives them like superhuman strength. I'm telling you, I go up against guys who are killers in my gym, but would just spar. But it's so different when you go up against somebody in a tournament with, with adrenaline rushing through them. Yeah. That grip is a death grip. It's, it's almost impossible to let out. Uh, and I knew that. I knew I was like, okay, I've been working a ton in the hospital. I've had some major life changes. I've... I got sick. I wasn't training, mm -hmm. but I still wanted to show up. You know, I felt healthy enough to show up, but even still then I was like, ah, I don't feel it. And I remember even warming up with uh, uh, one of our teammates. And I remember even in the warm up when him and I were just going 50%, it was like three minutes. Mm. And I stood up and I was visibly gassed. And I'm like, damn this is not going to be good. Like, I, I think I'm, I kicked over it. I wasn't infectious, but I was beyond the point of like, I was, I still needed a week. I mm -hmm. still need a week to like really get it back. I had not, you know how it is. If you don't work out for a week, if you don't run for a week, mm -hmm. if you don't do anything and then you just do it again, you're going to feel it the next day or, or the moment of. Yeah. Um, but I think a key to my success was always showing up. Mm -hmm. I record this video all the time before I ever step foot. I do this religiously. I did it before my CRNA interview. I do it before every tournament and it's goofy as hell. I literally set my camera in front of my steering wheel and I say to myself, no matter what happens, like watch this when this is all said and done. No matter what happens, you're either going to be really happy or really sad. Uh, you're going to be regretting something or happy that you said something. As long as you gave it your all, I'm proud of you. And I would always say that to, to myself. yourself. Always. Yeah. People laugh at it. Like I'll show it to my teammates. They're like, let's watch your speech to yourself now. And I, I, I religiously say it. Yeah. And luckily I've always like, especially the last three tournaments, I've gotten golden um, and I've won them all. I haven't, yeah, it's been nine in a row. And wow. uh, yeah, every single time I watch that video and I'm like, either way, I would have been proud of myself and I kept saying like you showed up and I've always showed up mm -hmm. even for my interview for the anesthesia program mm -hmm. I emailed that director knowing I didn't have the experience knowing I remember in the in the the bottom paragraph I said what else can I do to improve my resume my mother says I'm always running a million miles an hour but what else can I do during this journey mm -hmm. had I not sent that email because his response was, Muhammad, I am so impressed. I thought my resume was shit. I didn't think I had the experience. Like everywhere you looked at two to three years of ICU, this program accepted the average is six years. 
this is a 4.0 GPA. Yeah, I had a good GPA, but if I was missing something so key, like having ICU experience, and this guy literally said to me, well, while you're running, so I think your mother is right, but while you're running so fast, why don't you come here for an interview? I was shocked that he actually did this. And I'm like, holy shit, I got to take advantage of this. Like, I have to do it. So I studied for the CCRN, which was the critical care test that we had to take. Studied for the GRE, ended up taking it for grad school. Um, I went out there and I interviewed. And uh, again, it was the same thing. I showed up. I'm sitting there with a bunch of people. Uh, uh, one person in particular had on such a nice suit. I had on like a freaking black funeral suit you know, that was larger than me. And uh, at the time, I just, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how to dress up well. And it was just, that's all I had known. And uh, I'll never forget this. I'm, it was a two-part interview. There was a panel and there was a guy inside making them laugh hysterically. You think you're intimidated. Imagine somebody interviewing against you and you can hear him or, or her or they killing the interview, like absolutely slaughtering it. And I remember texting my dad and I'm like, he's making them laugh so much. And my dad's like, are you a comedian or are you like, <laughs> like my dad just like checked me. He's like, That's he's good. like, uh, so are you trying to make them laugh or are you trying to like impress them? And, uh, uh, so we went in there and the very first question is like, why are you here? I will never forget it. He looks at me, he's like, why are you here? I'm like, because I want to provide anesthesia. It's like, why do you want to do that? And I'm like, well, because I grew up in a small village and we didn't have good health care overseas. And I want to give back to people, not just my people, people all over the world, rural America here. And, and that interview went great. And then he was like, uh, we need to bring you back for one more person. And then I go back. This dude sat with me for two minutes. So I showed up. There were other people there interviewing. They took me in first. He's like, uh, why are you here? How many, how many programs did you fly over from Chicago to California? I looked at him and I'm like, I don't know how I had the balls to say this. I said, well, how many programs did you fly over from California to Chicago to do medical school? He's like, you looked me up. I'm like, I did. And he like got a chuckle out of it. He's like, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to do anesthesia? And so he asked me and then he's like, all right, we're done. It was like two minutes. Mm. And he like walks me down and I'm sitting there. And every other person after me was 20 to 30 minutes. So now I thought he did this as a favor, you know, maybe preemptively like, oh, come and do this interview. But then they realized I didn't have the experience. I'm never going to get in. Mm -hmm. um, sure enough, they both come down. They look at all of us and they're like, so we can take one of you, none of you or all of you. So at this point, I'm like, okay, these are some decent odds. Either they all sucked or we all did great or some of us did. But there was no number. He, they weren't like, we're going to take two of you. And now you're sitting there thinking about percentages. So they all went to their cars. I'm walking back. And the program director's like, do you need a ride to BART? And uh, I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. And he was looking at me, looking back, looking at me. And he goes, anyway, call your dad. You're in there not. Congrats. Just like that. Whoa. I swear, I'm getting goosebumps telling you this story. I'm, I'm getting goosebumps yeah. hearing this story. Yeah, I don't know if I, I never told you this. You've told, Maybe, you've told like, me. in brief uh, passing. Yeah, yeah, you've told me like variations yeah. of that, but that's the most extensive. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. heard that. Yeah. Whoa. And uh, I called my dad and literally my dad said, don't say a word. I can see your smile from Chicago. Congrats. Like he just like knew it. Like, he, like I'm really, like teary thinking about it. Yes. You know? He like knew it. He's like, you're in. He's like, I had no doubt. He's like, yeah, he's like, good job. And uh, the program director's like, are you hungry? You want to eat? You got time? I'm like, yeah. He took me out to dinner. And we just had dinner. He's like, good job. He's like, he's like, when you emailed me, he's like, we knew we wanted you. Like, almost right away. Right How did away. they know? I mean, I know because, you know. They knew, I think, during, during the panel interview, the program director and everybody else was paying attention to me. The one that wasn't was the associate program director, who is now my current program director, who is colleagues with my brother. Like he will text me, he's like, I just gave your brother a report. This is really weird. You know, he's like, I handed him <laughs> off seven pregnant women. Mm -hmm. So he's, we have a great relationship now. And he, I don't think he knows he wasn't paying attention to me. He was like on his laptop the whole time, like looking down. Finally, the only time he perks up was he's like, you do so much. 
he's like, how do we know you're going to focus on this program? Why do you do so much? And at the time, I was uh, working in the ICU at Northwestern. I was doing critical care transport. Uh, and that was crazy because those were 24-hour shifts essentially at a fire station. You were sleeping there. You were waking up at 2 in the morning to do these strokes in, from the middle of nowhere, Illinois, to UIC or Rush. And then you were sleeping in an ambulance hoping you didn't get another call again. I was doing that. I was teaching at a homeless shelter. Uh, that was all by mistake because I was an asshole. To, uh, I was getting out of the blue line and some homeless guy stopped me. And he was like, hey, doc, like saw me in my scrubs. I'm like, I don't have any money. He's like, no, 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 I got chest pain. I'm like, you got chest pain. And I knew nobody would take him serious. And I'm like, all right, hey man, let's go to this ER that I used to work at. I know everybody, I know we can get you in. So sure enough, we walked in and I'm like, man, I was such an asshole to this dude. I'm like, where do you stay at? He's like, man, I'm at, and then insert the name of the shelter. I reached out to them. I'm like, hey, let me come and teach like signs and symptoms of a stroke, signs and symptoms of a heart attack. like. Let's bring in some food. I'll bring in some food. Get, get these people here and I'll do it in a fun way, in an easy way, where it's like, hey, if you notice your friend all of a sudden can't lift their arm or if they're droopy. And people, like, I got a good response. Like, people are so appreciative. I think we have this idea of the, and I'm going on a tangent, about the homeless population, but they were, I mean, you've worked, you've seen it. Like, some of the coolest guys and girls and uh, women and men. And uh, anyway, so... Long story short, I'm sit I knew I, I knew I had impressed them. So the whole panel was there. They're sitting asking me all these questions. Tell me three things your colleagues would describe about you that mm -hmm. are your strengths. You know, all these bullshit mm -hmm. uh, standard questions mm -hmm. that I was answering very well. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, Joe like finally pops his head up instead of looking at the laptop, he's like why do you do so much, man? He's like, how do you do so much? He's like, yeah, you got good grades and this. And I remember, I'm like, all right, not to like, I said to them not to get on a sob story, but uh, during my senior year in high school, you know, we were uh, not in the best financial situations, not in the worst. We still had a roof overhead. We had food on the table, but it was rough to the point that like I was working at FedEx from 2 a.m. to 9 a.m. And I was paying for myself. I was anything my younger brother needed in terms of like sports I was paying for, uh, giving him money, you know, to, just for random things and just taking care of him on that end. And uh, he's like, how do you do so much? So I said, look, um, I worked at FedEx. It was a really hard time in my life. I didn't go to college out of high school. I was still working at FedEx at the time, helping uh, the finances with my family. And I said, when you have to lift boxes that are 50 and 60 pounds, at two or three in the morning, it gets so much easier to lift a book at two or three in the morning. And they all looked at each other and they got quiet. You can hear a pin drop. Like I can, I can tell like Mark Code is like, we're taking him. Like it was, but then I still had to do this like second phase, but I just think they knew. I'm now realizing when I did this, he sat with me for two minutes just cause he was like, oh, I like the kid, all right, go. Like yeah, he I, hadn't made his decision. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, yeah, the decision was made prior. All right. But that all came about from literally not being afraid to step into the room, knowing that I was either the least experienced, dumbest, brokest, least athletic, not the strongest, not the fastest, it doesn't matter for me. Mm -hmm. I'll outwork anybody. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, that's, this is the one thing that, that nobody will take from me. <laughs> I'll outwork the shit out of anybody, like hands down. I remember like my classmates would say things to me like, why are you studying so much? Or why are you doing this? Or why are you doing that? And I remember there was a, photo that was taken of me um, where a lot of my classmates were out on a Friday night. They had like parked their cars in the university parking lot and I was just studying and I had like knocked out like I was like foot out and I was just like sleeping like this. My hat was down. I'll show you the photo and my hat was down like this and one of them took the picture and that was that was on a Friday night. You know, that was, that was on a Friday night and uh, you know, looking back at it, I wouldn't change a thing. You've done so much with your life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think that's something I've really admired about you and why I have think our friendship has grown and you inspire me to grow. And certainly there's environmental factors of like how you grew up and yeah. maybe there was like, 
yeah, you never know what's going to get taken away or how long you're going to have something. And I think healthcare also teaches that question or yeah. that teaches that lesson too of like, Marathon runners get stage four lung cancer. <laughs> people, really? well, you know, just yeah, like and people, people, stuff, people yeah. smoke cigarettes yeah. every day for their yeah. whole life, and they, they live to be fine. ninety. Oh, you know, genetics. it's just like it's just not fair. Yeah. So like, yeah. you have to create some yeah. of that luck for yourself. Yeah. But like, what else drives you? Like, is it your parents? Is it like your religion? Is it like, is it you? Like, where does this come from? Where does this drive come from? I, I don't know. I. Sometimes I ask myself, but I just want to live in an island somewhere and just like. <laughs> you'd be so you'd be so bad at it though. Yeah, I would be bad at it. Like, <laughs> I would build it up or something. Yeah, I don't know you what would. I would do. Yeah, you'd start a hotel. Like yeah. they're just like you're always trying to yeah. build something. I, I I don't know. I think I think I've been really lucky along the way to meet incredible people. That have been less fortunate. Than I have been in certain aspects, but more fortunate than I have been in certain aspects. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, in 2016, meeting some, uh, the, the woman that I made a promise to when I was a medical interpreter. Um, yeah, tell that story, it's a, it's a yeah, good story. Yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, and I told it in my TED talk and I've told it time and time again, so it might seem a little recorded or rehearsed, but it was just facts. You know, I was an interpreter and I was interpreting for people mainly from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, the Gulf, the UAE, so very wealthy people. And they would come in and they would be taken care of and their clothes were nice and you can kind of tell they flew in for free and um, their health care was paid 100% and they would oftentimes try to tip me. And it wasn't like just $5, it, like they would try to give me hundreds and I, of course I couldn't take it, I don't want to be fired. Um, and then there was a moment where my boss said to me that we're getting another patient, I need you to be doing the translating for this woman and it was hard for me because um she was very shy and you know the middle eastern like muslim thing i said to my boss let it be a female translator with her because it's a female patient who's 16 and me translating like you need to change your clothes like these things are very sensitive for a man to tell a 16 year old middle eastern girl that's never heard that word from a man you know what i mean so uh but and, and luckily I ended up translating and I remember sitting between her and the anesthesiologist at the time and um, he was asking who else in the family is sick because she had a cardiac condition and she responded uh, three of my kids passed away so I'm saying it in first person right three of my kids passed away and then he said how and then you'd think she'd answer medically like say oh, you know, it was because of this condition and the stress on the heart. No, her answer was immediately, like, we didn't have any money, so nobody would see us. I'm translating that. And he was like, what do you mean? So then like going back and forth until the doctor, uh, somebody stopped us midway. And he's like, hey guys, come here for a second. And he like took us aside. He's like, she's a charity case. We're taking care of her. We flew her out. We put her in housing. I'm doing it. So Rush is aware and uh, he was an Arabic speaking uh, proceduralist and he's like, hey, just put her in the waiting room. I'll, I'll take her to the PICU when, when it's all said and done, when I'm done with the surgery. And then I sat with her in the waiting room for a couple hours and uh, she told me, she highlighted in detail, like, you know, she said to me that one of her kids passed away. He was just gasping for air inside their tiny home and they just watched him pass away. Uh, they would go to the main hospital and nobody would see them, you know, and uh, then her husband ended up having a stroke and you'd think like all this stress uh, and, uh, you know, thinking she was going to give me money when she opened up her purse. Keep in mind, at the time, we gave her vouchers to eat at the cafeteria, mm. right? Like she had nothing. Mm -hmm. I remember to this day going to Jewel Osco, buying chips, taking pots and pans from my house. And bringing them to because we just put her in student housing but there was no kitchen or anything and bringing all that and giving it to her it wasn't uh, part of my job specification of sort but mm -hmm. it is what it is and um uh she gave me these wafers and she said you know, promise me you'll help people in my position and 
promise me you'll help people who have lost everything. So when I say that, you know, she had so much wisdom that despite her losing three kids, daughters literally in the operating room as we speak, husband couldn't travel with them because he had a stroke. She was still looking out for other people. Telling this, I was 18, 19 at the time. Like, imagine me at 19, right? I couldn't even tie a fucking tie. My shirts were from Marshalls. Like, I had no dress shoes. I had nothing. My dress shoes were big. They gave me blisters. That, like, that, this is who I was at the time. Like, doing this job. And she was like, promise me you'll help people in my position, right? Somebody that can be so less fortunate than I was, right? Uh, but so more fortunate like wisdom wise to think of other people and that kind of shaped me right um after that moment i went to community college because i wasn't in school my high school gpa was trash mm -hmm. so 1.6 and yeah okay, i can't even <laughs> it's say pretty that, good. Man. yeah it's pretty good it's like so embarrassing That's impressive. to say like yeah and like it was so bad and uh, i had to test in to college level math and english and um, and then I just did the thing and I was just like, I got to fulfill this. And everyone I would meet along the way, you know, uh, gave me more motivation, right? Mm -hmm. Like I would just see the same thing. Like refugees that would have nothing would say, Hey, my son is sick. And all of a sudden I'm rushing to their tent. Nobody's sick. They had made bread and they just want to feed me. You know, again, it's like these less fortunate showing you what life is really about. Like what true life is. You want to talk about like to some extent, I wanted to be like the Middle Eastern version of Anthony Bourdain. I really did. Like I had, day I, 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 I cried watching Anthony Bourdain's documentary. I, I was on the plane watching. I was like in tears, especially at the end when his friends were so angry with them. And they're yeah. like, fuck you, you know? And they yeah. were like, and it just made me so sad because, you know, I'm like, I, I want to do what he does, but I want to go around the world and I want to highlight incredible healthcare providers who are like the only person in their village that chose not to go out and they're doing it with absolutely nothing and see if this episode would fundraise and then all of a sudden they get a clinic like i wanted to do that i think i have the name and the face to do it and maybe i will one day you mm -hmm. know i don't think anybody can steal this idea because i don't think anybody can do it as good as i do or would do it as good as I do because they're not going to be genuine or real about it or how having traveled. So yeah, thought about these ideas. I thought about like doing all that because everywhere I would go and meet these people that would just do so much. I had three paramedics that were paramedics in Syria that were helping me cover this night shift at night. I got to a point where I'm like, guys, I gave them half of my, like other than the medications, I gave them all my mm -hmm. kits for burns, trauma, every, they did it. Yeah. They would just come up to me, hey, this and this happened. Can you come and check it out? Yeah. So like meeting all these people along the way was just, you know, surreal. It's <clears throat> when uh, we had a water rescue mission and every we had one hypothermia case, but everybody else was soaked in cold Mediterranean water oh, in where February. Where is this? This was on the <clears throat> coast of Lesvos Island. And uh, like we can see Turkey, yeah, but we're not in it. We're in Greece, right? Yeah. Well, this and is a humanitarian trip. Yeah, this was a human. This was when I was doing water rescue. Okay. Uh, for this group called Mokara, which means my friend in Gaelic, mm. you know. So the Irish always. Yeah, Irish. Oh, always the Irish. <laughs> always, always okay. I'm new. Irish. I'm like that's cool. Like <laughs> yeah. if I'm doing this with the Irish, yeah. like I'm doing something right. For sure. Like and I could not be upset at that, and uh, you know just seeing like a woman so cold and seeing. Um, this guy who was just like routinely like such an asshole of a journalist who was Greek. And look, I have a lot of Greek friends. And there was a, but this guy was just always like in our faces. And the moment we'd bring a boat in, it's just like seeing him. Like I turned around, all of a sudden I saw him take off his shoes, take off his socks and give it to this woman that was shivering. You know, seeing that piece of humanity. So I've like seen a lot of glimpses of this humanity mm. that motivated me and inspired me to keep going mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of keep doing this. You yeah. know, um, obviously I wanted to <clears throat> get into Gaza. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's the elephant in the room. And I could not get in because I hold a, a Palestinian nationality. I have a Palestinian passport. So despite being born literally in the heart of Chicago at UIC, 
You know, I mean, it doesn't get like more hard of Chicago than that, mm -hmm. uh, where we both went for undergrad <laughs> as well. Yes. Where I did my labor and delivery rotation on the same, I think it was the same floor. Crazy. Um, and yeah, so I, I was denied entry there, but I was willing to, you know, sacrifice it all for that too. You know, I had to get my lawyer to do a will, God forbid, in case something happened to me. Um, so yeah, I, I just continue to get inspired and I'm blessed. I'm lucky, you know. I get to be here, we get to chat, and I don't know where I got it from. I don't know if I got it from my grandfather who instilled like the craziest work ethic in me. I don't know if I got it from my dad. Like I had a stent where I worked with him in Gary, Indiana. And I would just work like three days a week. He was doing six days a week. Mm -hmm. And he would wake me up at like 4.30 in the morning. And I would sleep as he drives. Mm -hmm. And we'd do this 12 hour shift and I'm sleeping as he's driving back. And he was doing it six days a week. And I'm looking at this man. I'm like, how the hell is he doing this? Mm -hmm. Like, this is absolute, this is exhausting me. Yeah. And I think seeing that motivated me. I think I have such a soft spot for, you know, whenever I see people selling like water or Gatorade on a highway exit, like I did that. I sold water and Gatorade and peanuts on the highway exit, you know? So like having gone through those experiences, like seeing fast food people, uh, I worked at a fast food restaurant, seeing people in the back of the house, I was a dishwasher, you know? Um, people working overnight, I did that at a gas station, you know? I did it at FedEx. People taking shit from people working like in sales, I did that at Foot Locker. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, working a job like all those experiences to a job that was physically mentally and emotionally draining being anything in healthcare you know so that's like it just like kind of morphed like i i would i can't imagine myself like if i were to go back in time and think when i was sitting in front of this woman i would be taking care of people doing all this, I would, I, I wouldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And it, and it kind of sucks you in. Like there are parts where I would question it when I was in Africa for, for quite some time, you know, and the team, the surgical team had left and it was just me. And there was like uh, one family practice doctor who was Kenyan. And then there was just me and I was doing all the anesthesia pre-ops and it was so sad turning some people away. I remember watching, it was so surreal because I remember watching an episode of ER mm -hmm. and Noah Wiley was like my favorite character, Dr. Carter. And yeah. when he went to Africa, he was like so stunned, like where a kid came in with a diagnosis, I don't know what it was, like leprosy or something. Mm -hmm. And Noah Wiley was like, what's going to happen to him? And the nurse was like, he's just going to die. And he like couldn't accept it. He's like, I can't. I, and he said something famous. He's like, I, I, and, it, and it was in the it was in the show. He was technically like a Northwestern graduate of School of Medicine, and he was the, mm -hmm. came from a very rich family in Chicago. So he was a, this wealthy guy. And he's like, I'd like to consider myself pretty like aware of the world, but I realize all we know in America are Big Macs and iPods or iPads or whatever it was at the time. And uh, and I remember being in Africa, and we had this kid and. Uh, he had come in and it was just like back to back. He came in, um, like scanned his heart, called a cardiologist friend of mine, listened to his, his heart and his lungs, read his echo. And I'm like, we cannot do this procedure. Like it is not safe to do this procedure here. Mm -hmm. They had been waiting six months. They traveled 18 hours to get to this point. And here I am telling him no. And now I'm like frantically scrambling like where am i going to find an interventional pediatric cardiologist in maguri county in the middle of nowhere africa mm -hmm. and then they're like in tanzania i'm like that's in another country mm -hmm. at this point um and then the very next case this woman comes in with a broken ankle yeah and instead of her foot being flat it was like this and yeah. it was it was fixed not fixed. Yeah, it like, like broke and it just stayed. So like when she's she like walked, on her, her, toes all yeah, the time. her all the time. Yeah. And we couldn't do anything. Oof. And I just remember telling her, I'm sorry, like we don't have an orthopedics team coming in for this much time, like taking her information and then sending these photos to 
my orthopedic friends and they're like, man, we're going to have to like, it's going to have to all break. And then we have to pin it. Oh yeah, that's true. And then Horrible. Like, yeah. The, then we have to ensure she has PT. And mm, then yeah, like, all this follow up care. That's like going to be really hard to yeah. actually do. And then it like brought me back to that moment when I was 18, 19, watching that episode, feeling so hopeless. Yeah. Like, damn, this is like happening to me now. You know what I mean? And I thought it was just like, a TV show or a movie. <laughs> and then it motivated me to come back, though. Yeah. You know, it motivated me to say, like, there's still some work that needs to be done. Right. You know? No, makes um, sense. And, and I think uh, it motivated me to learn Spanish, and it motivated me to want to go to some of these Latin American countries. And the last part is just to show the beauty of our people. Yeah. You know, it's just, I get this question all the time, like, why are you here? Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's like a super Christian evangelical medical team or... Just tell them, I just want to help people. And they'll tell me why. And I'm like, well, you know, my people have not been dealt the best hand. And if I get an opportunity to help them, which I did in Lebanon and refugee camps and Palestinian refugee camps, then I would. If not, then I'm going to help people similar to them. Yeah. Despite race, color, religion, didn't matter to me. And it's still to this day. So, uh, yeah, we carry it proud. And I think that's the another inspiration for me. It's like... I don't only have a duty to myself, but I am also a representation of who my people are in the West, in the East, everywhere I step foot, essentially, you know, at the end of the day, my name is Mohammed. I can't hide. Yeah, I might out there, they might think I'm Greek or Spaniard or Italian. At the end of the day, you know, when they ask me, who am I? It's, it's Mohammed. I can't hide from that. And where are you from? Palestinian. So you kind of have to, you know, always be the best version of you. Especially when, you know, the world is wondering who you are. And when your existence is trying to be erased to some extent. So, um, and I think these are the motivating factors um, where I've come from. And I, I don't know, I never looked at myself and I'm like, man, I've been dealt a shitty hand. No matter how bad it got. Like, I, I, right. I was never like, oh, this, like, yeah, there were moments like, this sucks. Like, I remember... I got out of a shift at Foot Locker and I was sleeping in my car prior to getting in. It was a piece of shit, 1995 Honda Accord. Yeah. The heat didn't work. It's like freezing outside. I had a blanket and I was sleeping in my car for three hours waiting for this FedEx warehouse to open up. But even then I wasn't like, oh, this sucks. I'm like, okay, we'll do it. You know, and same for everything else, really. Yeah. Yeah. I just... Uh, I learned to make the best of it. No, know? no kidding. Yeah, yeah. You're you're a professional at it. And I mean, your stories are incredible. They've always been incredible. Yeah. You have yeah. just gone above and beyond to the best of your ability your whole life and you live it every day. And I really admire that about I try. you. I can be a pain in the ass sometimes. Yeah, you know. You we, know? Yeah. <laughs> so, we overlook like that. Ben yeah. knows. Oh, well, <laughs> like, you know. Especially he's like, when I go down my rabbit hole, he just yeah. ignores me. He's like, let him just like get out of this thing. He'll come back in two days. And I love how you talk about Ben. It sounds like you two are dating. Yeah, just like... I mean, like Ben is, Ben is. He's man. a good friend. He's a good guy. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll never, I'll, it's just one gesture. I mean, yeah. when my grandmother passed away, mm-hmm. it was two in the morning. It was 2013. It was in the middle of, I think it was in the winter time. Yeah, it was, it was in November. Um, we had just finish my birthday dinner yeah it was me ben andrew and mark ryan and we were eating in pilsen and then uh we came back andrew was hanging out and uh um yeah i got a call and my mom called me and she's like you know that um, passed away and yeah for some reason i just called ben i'm like my grandmother died he's like hey let me call you back yeah and he like doesn't call me back and i'm waiting he doesn't call me back 20 <laughs> minutes and then i hear yeah. a knock on my door and it was ben yeah. and he just like showed up you know, and he always shows up. He always shows up. Yeah. Like, I, I, I just found a, a card from him that he wrote me in 2016. Yeah. Yeah, it was bad. I mean, I was in California. He was in Michigan. Mm-hmm. It was Thanksgiving time. Every restaurant was closed. Yeah. And I, like, FaceTimed him, and we were both eating canned soup. <laughs> like, it was just, like, <laughs> it was during Thanksgiving. Like, yeah. we, he was away from his family. I was away from my family. And, uh, and he, he like wrote me this card. He's like, Hey, I'm really proud. Uh, you got these awards. Uh, I'm getting like emotional thinking about this. 
he's like, I'm super proud of you. I'll always be there, you know. And uh, yeah. he showed up. He came to my TED talk. He's, yeah, he's he's been you know everywhere, and he can be a pain in the ass for yeah. sure. I uh, like drives me crazy. Sure. I drive him crazy like no other. But of course. yeah, he he's a real one. He's and part, and, yeah. I, and and so are you. I mean, you know, we can't just sit there and talk about Ben and not, <laughs> like I mean. There's been some really down points in my life where you were like, you know, you were there no matter what. And there was like no question. It's like, hey, I'm here to listen. What do you want from me? Like, mm-hmm. what do you need? What do mm-hmm. you? It was just that. And and I, I'll never forget it. It's it's crazy how, you know, I didn't know you at the time. And I was one of the very few people that was willing to like, I think I was the only person willing to give you a car. Yes. To like <laughs> use for clinicals. And, you know, when you asked me for it, I just remember telling Andrew, I'm like, I don't even know this girl. I'm going like, <laughs> to give her my car to use. And like. And you did. Did the battery die on you once? No. Okay. It died on somebody else. I think. Yeah. Good. And, you know, and then we just like formed this friendship and it, it didn't go away. It no. didn't go away. No. It's you not know? good. And for those who don't know, I was the speaker at Marie's wedding. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> yes. He was, uh, he was quite popular. Yeah. For anyone who's listening on the podcast, yeah. you can't see it. But yeah. um, he has been called the Muslim McDreamy before. <laughs> My aunts were going insane yeah. after he did the speech. Yeah. Is he single? Yeah, is What's he, he single? doing? Yeah, he oh, where does he live? How do you know him? Yeah, just like. That nickname came about in the refugee camp in Greece. Oh, really? Yeah, because yeah. my hair was all over the place. Right, yeah. Curly. I was showering like once a week. For sure. I had like normal clothes on. Yeah. My <laughs> stethoscope on my hip. Yeah. You know, and I was like seen, you know, I was playing soccer with the kids. Yeah. And I was like taking care of the clinic and I was teaching English and. There was like a group of like just having graduated Mm -hmm. like European lawyers, mainly female, that were like giving a big fuck you to the system. Yeah. And they were just like, yeah, we just silently had a crush on you from afar. (laughs) The name just came up. Actually, I can't even tell the story. The story is kind of crazy. The name came about a little bit later, but I found out about it. Yeah. After I returned. I love it. Yeah. Well, the the credits on the movie have rolled a while yeah, ago. I know. And that we, crazy. we used that as a marker before yeah. to, to give it a stop. Yeah. But um, yeah. I just want to thank you for sharing all these great stories. You're really incredible. Um, you know, I started this podcast because I just see that people are so multifaceted. Um, I enjoy wine. You know, this is on the Slick Wines platform. But like, it's so much more yeah. like I got into wine because I got into food and I got into food because I like people and that's why I was a nurse and I see so many parallels with you too. So I just want to say thank you for sharing all those awesome stories with me. You were the coolest. Maybe, um, maybe one day I'll open that restaurant. Maybe one day you'll successful. hear about uh, yeah, a potential restaurant yeah. opening and yeah, if not, restaurant I'll concept. If Bourdain this thing and just write a book called Hospital Confidentials. Where there you after go. That That's a, not a bad idea. Never get a job ever again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that is true. Because he thought he was going to get fired, right? Yeah. He was like, I'm fucked after yeah. this. Like, He's nobody's like, going to hire me. Yeah, that's oh, exactly if I did what one it was. Hospital Confidentials. Yeah. Is that, is that a technically a. Has it been patented or trademarked? Like, I can't do that, right? Because the kitchen know. confidential is like... Oh, no, I'm sure you could. I don't like think hospital he, confidential? I don't think he's got, like, IP on it. that. People are curious about what happens. Like, I know, people dude. People really are, like... That'll be our next, that'll be our like, next people episode. People always <laughs> ask me, like, do people hook up in hospitals? Like, yeah. because they watch just Grey's Anatomy nonstop. Well, you know, it you is... Know? It's junk TV. It is junk TV. Like they ask me all these questions. And I'm like, no, we just give people Oreos after surgery. Yeah. Uh... But yeah, well, thank you. 